Have you ever found a game that kept popping up on Steam only once you clicked it, the name DigiPen Institute of Technology appeared? No? Surely you've heard of FPS Chess, Witch Punk, Breadsticks, or Tag? Still no? Well, this will be a chronological look at every game under the publisher name DigiPen Institute of Technology. Since Steam did a terrible job of putting these games in chronological order, and I genuinely hope that seeing games like these will inspire others to make their own game, since these are student-made games, a topic I have never covered before in the indie game space. There are over a hundred of these games, each made by different people, which means each game will vary in quality, style, and genre. But why are these games on Steam in the first place? Well, according to Jeremy, the director of the game design program, we put things on the game gallery so that students can showcase their work and so that we can say they've published their games, which of course, they have. I think this will make all the difference in terms of students' ability to get jobs. Just being able to say, I have two published titles on Steam is huge. My name is Jeremy Holcomb. I'm the program director for the Bachelor's of Arts in Game Design program, and so I oversee all of the courses and structures for the Bachelor's of Arts in Game Design students. And I work closely with Benjamin Ellinger, who is the program director for the Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science and Game Design, um, and look at different types of design classes, different types of designers, and on some level, answering the ridiculous question, what do you want to be when you grow up? first game made by DigiPen Institute of Technology was called Perspective, which contains a minimalistic soundscape of chimes and occasionally whoops. There's a screen that's very nostalgic of old Super Joy games, I mean uh, Nintendo games, is a simple 2D platformer, actually it's a 3D platformer, actually it's a first person walking simulator that's also a 3D platformer that's also a 2D platform. Finishing arcade cabinets can unlock further parts of the map, and the more levels you complete, the more difficult it becomes. When you are in first person, it's just a synth, but when you switch perspectives, the drums kick in. Five years later, in 2017, we got the second game that they ever produced, which is called Cures and Curios, on May 15th, 2017. It is a VR-only game, and it looks fun, but I can't play it since I don't have VR. It seems like a VR potion making game, and there's plenty of videos on the internet about it, so it's kind of like a VR potion craft. At this point, there has only been one game in 2012 and one game in 2017, but once we get to 2018, there are six games, V or Phi, but to use a controller, and seems like a simply smooth experience where you collect orbs and souls, Dashing is an option, it's a very atmospheric puzzle game. Different objectives appear to give variety to the gameplay, like following the dots, which is the hardest part about the game. At least that was the last level. Poppy's Nightmare looks like a simple side-scroller. The intro is a bunch of drawings stitched together, and uh, this is the game. Cheery bouncy music and shooting crayons at animals for camp. There are power-ups that upgrade your weapon, though not by much. And surprisingly, there is voice acting, but again, it isn't much. And it's only reactionary, like grunts. Not gonna lie, I started dozing off while playing this, which is kind of funny considering this whole thing is supposed to be a nightmare. Which, by the way, for a game called Poppy's Nightmare, the aesthetic is anything but a nightmare. On May 15th, 2018, Jera was published. Now, this is a start that immediately pulls you in. An intro cinematic showing how a beast slaughtered civilians, but the remaining survivors defeated it, returning it to its darkness. To one day return. We can jump, 
Earth Swim, Touch Checkpoints, Avoid Enemies, Fire Dash, Collect Fragments, and the art direction is very beautiful. This game has a very pacifist approach to platforming, which is something I don't see a lot in the platforming space. However, something that is a problem in this platforming space is the stick drift, which is a little bit of a problem as well as glitching through boundaries. Now there's a boss battle, which took all of our relics, but we can't attack him and the music goes so incredibly hard. Luckily, we can attack the monster with himself. Once you get the fire relic back, you can attack. OMG or 1 Million Guns is a vampire survivors roguelike type game. Guitar heavy music, you kill robots, you pick up different guns. There's also a challenge mode where you can toggle specific options and this type of game will come up later in 2021. Toki Time Trial was released on July 20th, 2018. The soundtrack is an ambient hum. The UI moves depending on where you hover your mouse. It immediately throws you into the game with a whooshing sound. There is a non-gamer mode versus normal mode. Well, you all know which one I'm picking. We spawn in a first person point of view where you grab some glasses. If you pause, it equals a help menu. It's a bullet time game. It's pretty loud, so I had to turn down the volume a bit. I have green legs for reasons I genuinely don't know, and you have to reach the checkpoint to progress. Dev notes are littered throughout the level in case you need a hint, which you can actually collect. Depending on if you're in bullet time or normal time, specific objects will interact with you in different ways. Once you collect discs, you can throw them. These discs can be used as platforms. As you can see, this is a puzzle platformer that can be difficult at times, but it's super satisfying to solve the puzzles. If you choose non-gamer mode, it lets you pick individual levels. Tokyo Time Trial is just a fun and good experience, especially if you like puzzle platformers. Halfway Home was the last game released in 2018. It is a visual novel that has a disclaimer at the beginning for mental health issues. The Sunflower House is where we spawn. I like that the simple art style contrasts against the detailed characters, one of which you can name, aka your character. This person's name is Max. <laughs> Funny, I have a friend named Max, and each of these different people that you meet along the journey have different fonts per person. All of a sudden, everything gets eerie. Turns out it's already been six months, even though it feels like you just got here. The soundtrack has me looking over my shoulders like something is going to pop out at me. A disembodied voice speaks over me in an aggressive negative tone that is very unsettling. My character then says that that was the embodiment of depression. Timothy is a new character that appears, as well as a stress, fatigue, and depression bar. This is literally a social battery simulator. Now we are playing Hangman in the Garden, and fun fact, I didn't win. Some actions are locked if you have not unlocked enough of a certain skill. And after this realization, I met Charlotte and Trissa, which are new characters in the story. And I love that all three answers are the same, except in different tones. The loud one and the quiet one. Somehow, I relate to both characters. Awareness, grace, and expression are also tabs that can be upgraded with certain events. Day one was basically the tutorial. Now I can go wherever I want and in whatever order I choose. Later we learn that Charlotte has antisocial personality disorder. Wow, that that's... Li 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 the bro is literally me. Each character has a specific issue that they are going through. And... Before I knew it, it's my last day at this place, so I say goodbye, except I returned to this place in a time loop type fashion. What's going on? This is a very inclusive game, so if a social battery management game about identity and mental aspects seems interesting to you, I urge you to give it a try and find the true ending. While 2018 only had 6 games published, 2019 had 15 games published. The first of these during this year was Perdition. The date August 4th, 1994 appears, and we spawn 
near a car crash in this low poly environment. In this area, we learn that we can automatically sprint, that dash takes stamina, we can double jump, use armor, and punch, and destroy flying robots. This is a objective-based walking sim, where we can pick up a gun or operate a console. Actually, it's a shooter where guns have multiple attack variants, whether it be bullet type or literally throwing the gun at lethal company employees. I also love that throwing guns just makes them explode. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it does look cool and feel cool to play. Overdrive is also a feature during combat that just feels even cooler. Basically, we have to find consoles to point lasers into the sky. Not sure why though, but we'll figure that out soon enough. There's words on screen in between loading sections. The game does a good job with the fighting feeling tense due to a loud electronic track and bullets even louder. Next is Beyond, a top-down shooter dungeon crawler with puzzles. You avoid slash defeat enemies, collect orbs, keys, and health, destroy pots, jump gaps, find a key, open door, fight monster, type of loop. Once you gain three orbs, you get an upgrade. The hitboxes are a bit too big when it comes to moving near ledges, and you can switch between bullet types. The Luminous starts us off with a photosensitivity warning. There is story mode and horde mode, and I chose story mode. After this, we select our difficulty setting. What I love about this game is that the UI is actually on your shoulder, and there is actual voice acting. Both of these I just love. So far out of the games we played so far, this is definitely in my top 10 already. Since this face is covered up, lip syncing isn't necessary, which is a very clever move on the developer's part, and I appreciate that. All of a sudden, the elevator broke and we crashed down. There are some mushrooms here, the ones that were very similar to earlier on the poster. Great foreshadowing, honestly. We learned that the blue vials are flares. All of a sudden, an alien pops out of nowhere and we run to safety. Finally, we see a health pack. The other thing that you realize is that you have radio communication with other team members occasionally to help you escape. And if you go in this room, there is a new weapon that harvests oil from mushrooms to use as an attack and it can break wood. After the cutscenes, you realize that you must escape from the underground to reunite with teammates on the surface. Something I also realized is that the monsters aren't all that scary, just kind of annoying, and I found an item that lets me fire a charge shot. That's pretty cool. Next is Dino Delivery. Immediately, the game says gamepad required, so I plug in my good old controller. Honestly, I just prefer controller, so whenever a game is like, hey, use this, I definitely will. Even if not, I, I will always use controller. After that, I noticed two things, that the narrator is good and the quality settings are good in this game. You are Pip, and your dino is named Parcel. You accomplish goals that the townsfolk give you. We have a slingshot that shoots targets, Dialogue is color coded so it's easy to pay attention to objectives, and I got stuck. But it's a pretty wholesome game. On April 30th, 2019, Foul Magic was published. You are a chicken. With electronic music in the background, infinite jumps, you dash into enemies, use magic to obliterate your opponents, you glide gracefully over death, it's basically a race to see if you can make it to the bottom before dying to fire or enemies. Yep, this is the game, it's basically just a vertical flappy bird. I Am Gooey is made with the sticky engine, how clever. I don't know why, but OBS was having weird aspect ratio issues, yet on my screen it was working fine, as well as the on and off button glitching on screen. The puzzle in this one are confusing in this top-down dungeon puzzle. Not even sure how I figured out the previous puzzle before this room, honestly. The game tells you nothing except move. Eventually, I figured out the puzzle. Later, you can pick up fire emblems, though I'm not exactly sure what they do. It's basically the same type of puzzle over and over again. After more requires a controller to play, and already this is the weirdest game I've played so far from this publisher, but I honestly kinda really love it. We are Dee, and we meet the Overseer. This is a spirit realm since we are dead. The one goal here, kill the Overseer. There's multiple choice dialogue, humor, and I already love this art direction. Basically, we have to get stronger so we can beat the Overseer in this psychedelic 3D platformer. We can use power-ups, break boxes, collect gems. Honestly, this is probably high in my top 10 list already if I were to make one. Jerry and Jeffrey are characters we can talk to, find treasure chests, and these flowers are checkpoints as well as an upgrade shop. So they have actual dual functionality. You must collect items to attack. And later you find Hex, which is another interactable character, aka 
your brother. And here it's discovered that a plague killed both your character and your brother, as well as both of you were knights in the army of before more. After this discovery, your sibling now travels with you and actually helps you in combat. We can grapple onto tracks by locking on the Hex. We can also lock onto our enemies now, thanks to Hex. There's actually a lot of strategy to combat. While combining locking on, dodge, stealing saws, and attacking, combat has a very methodical approach that isn't just button mashing. Also, don't backtrack by the way, otherwise you will have to fight the same boss again. I made that mistake. On June 6, 2019, The Pilgrim was published. This is probably the coolest DigiPen logo transition I've ever seen. Here we have a surreal menu, and presentation-wise, I am extremely impressed with this one. In my top 10, for sure. In this mixed media experience, I realized that I just love the character design. This is a psychedelic point-and-click puzzle game. This is one of those games where you could make the argument, yes, video games are art. Probably the most unique version of I Spy that I've ever played. The soundtrack makes me feel like I'm floating through space. I don't have a lot to say about it because it's a super short game, but the puzzles do get more challenging over time, and I genuinely was having a great experience with it overall. Merge recommends controller, but then none of the buttons work, so I tried keyboard, and that kinda works. This game can be multiplayer, and the only time I won was because of melee weapons. Moving, rotating, and shooting was the only thing I could do, everything else I just couldn't get to work. I kept looking at the how to play, wondering if I did something wrong, but then I realized that there's just a certain skill level that the AI has that makes you lose most of the time, as if it's stuck on expert mode. You basically have to be the first one to grab all the attachments to win. Mosh Pit is another controller recommended game. Let's hope it works this time. These are super simple controls with two characters that you can choose, Urban and Boombox. This is a two-player game where you protect the band. Man, this is like if Friday Night Funkin' was good. While the animation is smooth, the two-player controls just feel cramped, and what you see is what you get with this sort of game. On August 3rd, 2019, Delta Blade 2700 was published. This four-player game has controller support, and you can be one of these colored droids. I'm green, because, well, you know. I found a glitch where all I could throw was shurikens, or that's what I thought because it only happens after I throw my sword, so you have to retrieve your sword to get back your normal moveset. As a single player experience, it's basically just training mode, so this game is better with multiplayer. Vectrix has no music whatsoever in the menu. Well, that's a creative choice. There is literally no audio playing whatsoever. Okay, so a minute later, now there's music. We have five lives to start. I think it's a survival game, but the objective is so confusing. A few minutes later, I realized I could shoot, which makes my score increase. After a certain score threshold, the color changes. Adventure Slime. Now this is a quest for a bouncy mushroom room. Not gonna lie, it should have just been bouncy mushroom. No controller support, so... Goodbye to my wrists. There's an omniscient narrator over some cheery drums and electronic synths. There are secrets you can find. There's a butterfly counter. Are you kidding me? Project Gemini has controller required. So this is a two player platformer. Uh oh, this means I now have to play the game like brothers. While a cyberpunk like OST blares in my headphones, there is a laser wire that appears if you get too far away from another player. If either one of you die, it's game over. And it's very hard to play with only one controller, so I do not recommend it as a single player experience. This is the last game of 2019, and I'm not gonna lie, this is probably one of my favorites that released in 2019 from this publisher. On December 27th, 2019 is Parasite. This was always one of those games I kept seeing in the store but had no idea its association with DigiPen until recently. We are met with voice acting and already I love the aesthetic of this game. Khan is the host of this dating game show and the vibe of this game is very comedic. We must set up our account by answering totally real questions. We are a virus that is teaming up with its host to take over the world using this game show. So it's a visual novel that's also a comedy, that's also a platformer, that's also a dating show, that's also a game show, that's also a shooter. After choosing who to date because this game 
actually gives you that option. This is the first game from this publisher that has actually made me laugh so hard. I love that the other person has a tolerance meter where the more you talk to them, the more they tolerate you. Wow, just like real life. But unlike real life, you can retry dates as many times as you like. Also, I just got the name of the game. Oh, that's clever. Once our date is successful, since we are a virus, we infect our date. And if we do it enough times, we can control the president of the world, or at least Khan thinks so. <laughs> this character named Dan is literally just Johnny Bravo. Hey, baby. Cool. Name's Dan. You can commit two people to gain popularity of the site and gain new skills. Kate the Cook is probably my favorite character out of all of them, however, and total opposite to that, Annie is that annoying, high-pitched anime girl, and most people just think she's annoying because they delete their accounts after talking to her. Yeah, sounds about right. Especially with the emotional whiplash of choosing the wrong answer for Annie is actually hilarious. In 2020, Digipen released 17 games. The first one of these is Excalibots, a knight taking a nap next to a tree, a paper-infused animated cutscene, a controller appearing for like five seconds and then disappearing before I could read it. Movement wise, we can roll, attack, and talk to people, and that's basically the options you have. We must save the town from fancy sorted goblins. After a while, I realized that the flags are levels, and there's some light voice acting equivalent to watching a tennis match. Weapons can be picked up, and currently we can only hold two of them. I love that the health bar is a sword, combat is super simple, it says that you can do a special attack, so I do it, but I can't do it again, maybe because I have to time it right? Not sure, actually it has to do with this bar. There is a cart where you can equip the swords you've already unlocked, treasure chests can give you more weapons, knights are checkpoints, different swords have different special abilities giving more variety to combat, the second level is a knight with some different enemy types, swords can break if the green bar depletes, the rainbow knife is my favorite because it circles you with rotating knives as a barrier of damage to the enemy, and then I got stuck because I literally can't jump in this game. After the two levels we face against the goblin king. Okay, so I almost won with a sliver of health, but I died. Making me realize this fight is actually pretty hard. There's barely any indication where he is going to attack, unlike those goblins from earlier. I felt actual dread while fighting this guy, and the music heightens your sense of determination. An actually challenging boss fight overall. Good job. Next is Crucible. So OBS is doing the shift crop thing to the screen. Lovely. Option wise, there is normal and legendary. This is a dragon shooter that feels like an arcade game. Hitboxes are extremely generous and magic explosives are available to you as a special move which wipes out the board. Overshadow's first quote is, this game uses controllers. Is that plural? Uh oh. Luckily, I could start with one player. I'm going to be real here, I have no clue what I'm supposed to do. Oh, okay, so basically you either are the monster or a human. If you are a monster, you must kill the humans to get points. If you are a human, you get points by hitting the monster. Not much to this game, honestly, especially because it's multiplayer and only me is playing. Bug Blast, another asteroids-like game. There are five objectives to complete. Once we get to an objective, we kill a certain threshold of bugs. Next objective, more bugs. With each objective, the threshold increases every time to a higher value. Sightbringer, purple platforms where we can jump and wall jump. The soundtrack is very ambient. We must avoid the darkness or we will die. The wall jumping took a while to get used to. I got stuck here where I'm supposed to dash to this orb. The only problem is I die right after. All of a sudden I launch into the air. I honestly don't know how I did that. Oh, so I was supposed to use it to launch me. Okay. This is another one of those platformers where you have to avoid everything and the game is over. Okay. Nora or Nara has an intro cutscene where we break out of a giant vial. We can jump dash and bullet time in this very futuristic platformer. And these little platforms near us give us an additional dash. Lasers get introduced to make it more challenging. Whenever I died, it always felt like it was my fault, not some dumb hitbox. The game times you per level, and it's hard, but it makes me want to keep playing it. So remember how I said it feels like my fault? Yeah, some of the hitboxes are a little too big. Yes! 
I've probably done this, no joke, like a hundred times. Oh my gosh. I finally beat the game and yeah, so that last level alone took 14 minutes. Homeland Laid to Rest has an intro freeze frame cutscene to this third person game that is a dungeon crawler and has destructible physics. We have a boomerang blade. Meditation heals us. We have a grappling hook. We can target multiple enemies and there's a bit of platforming involved. I love that you can throw your weapons and still be able to punch. At the end, there was a boss battle that was really challenging and enjoyable. Astra has a trap song for the start screen. That I was not expecting. This is a first person shooter where you can kick. Is this anger foot? No, it's Astro, where you can move your head forward instead of moving your gun closer to zoom in. It transitions into Techno Club with music to match. We can break glass, pick up different guns. There are voice lines on screen, but no voice acting. We can shoot aliens. And once we arrive here in the club, the music is at full volume. I'm supposed to meet a DJ at the bar, but I'm not really sure where to go. Actually, we are supposed to go in the center and fight the swarm of aliens and robots. After that, I got, a uh, stuck again. It's never super clear which direction I'm supposed to go except for the green doors, but when I go through this one, I'm kind of still stuck. That is until I knocked out this generator. I love how the guns are designed and that you can pick them up from flying pods. Well, I didn't know I was playing Portal 3. I also realized that the death screen is an abrupt you are dead, which was kind of funny to me. EOS is a first person puzzle game with voice acting and takes place in a garden museum. Metals can unlock doors and the first puzzle is literally from Portal. Okay, so when I made that joke earlier, I wasn't expecting to see an actual portal. This game is about using day and night to solve puzzles. We play as EOS, a young girl. And then all of a sudden, the game crashed. Now, normally I would just move on to the next game, but this is a walking simulator and I am genuinely interested in the story being told here. You can input the medallion and then recall it whenever you want as if you have the force. What I love about the story is that we can see the mother and father here, but the closer we get, it's just the father. The attention to detail is so subtle. This does relate to the story and I won't say too much, but man, I love this game. Quest for Papa Reloaded has cyberpunk vibes, especially with the smooth cyber jazz that I was not expecting. We get a intro cinematic with a narrator. The story of this game is that a father was so deep into gambling, he bet his own child. Man, that is a, some dark stuff. So we play as the daughter aiming for revenge. Although that intro got dark, the gameplay is a stark opposite with energetic guitar and drums behind a top-down shooter. Multiple weapons you can switch, the music is very punk, the dialogue is not too serious, which leads to some comedic moments, the trombone is my favorite gun, and there are these little hubs you'll stumble into where you can talk to characters, upgrade guns, change your costume, and gain more health. Project Senko recommends that you use a controller. <laughs> so, uh, this game is just completely in a different language, probably because there are multiple campuses at Digipen. This is a beat-em-up game with a swing, dash, kick, and block mechanic. Honestly, video games are one of those art forms where it almost transcends language barriers. Well, except when you have to read dialogue. I may not understand the story, but I know that we must get rid of these praying mantis robots. And I also realized that there are actual combos in this game, so combat can get more interesting. Soulcaster is a 2D platformer and is a super simple level-based puzzle game. We can do actions like push buttons, move objects, and once we get this soul casting artifact, now things get more interesting. You can create a clone and then switch with it to progress further. The tricky part is in order to switch souls, you need a direct line of fire. By level eight, it's a really tricky one, so I was stumped for a while. And later, more elements get introduced over time to make the puzzle challenging, but overall, it's a pretty satisfying puzzle game. Isles of Limbo is a top-down fighter. It starts off with just one-hitting bats with ethereal weapons. Pretty soon, bigger monsters spawn that take multiple hits and also looks like a different animation style, which is a nice touch. Once you complete an area, following the blue flames and moving skyblocks leads you to the next area. Then, a 3D cutscene plays after three levels. 
Goodnight Lily has a intro that is a freeze frame cinematic. Your lantern has power. It can run out, so you have to refill it, otherwise the darkness will consume you. The lantern can burn spider webs. And I realized that this is a horror game where you have to save your lantern power, but not too much, otherwise the hands get closer. It's almost better to not use your lantern most of the time. The hands obstruct your vision, so you don't want them to get too close. And after a grueling final battle, we make it out. Flatline. Uh, it's just a black screen. <laughs> what? great gameplay. I tried restarting it about three times and all we get is a black screen. Well, I clicked and uh, now we're here. I don't think this was meant to happen. No wonder this game is called Flatline. So since I can't play this game, here's a, a trailer of the game. Netgunner. For this game, I chose ETA. That's like most of my name. So sure, why not? So this is a multiplayer game. Uh-oh, a battle shooter where multiplayer is required. Otherwise, yeah, this is not a good single player experience. Now for the last game released in 2020, Ark Apelago. There's an intro cinematic in the form of scroll drawings for this 2D platformer where you can jump, dash, and wall jump. Not a lot to say about this one. You just traverse a bunch of sky islands. One million fatal guns. I believe this is a sequel to a previous game, making this the first sequel in the list. It's first person instead of top down. There's a break slash glitch core esque music playing in the background. There is no zoom, only hip firing. This game has floors, which are levels. Floor two looks exactly like floor one when we start, except there are just more enemies. Robots and boxes drop guns in hell. You know, there's been a lot of rare guns I've found so far doesn't seem that rare to me. So this game says there are 1 million guns, where really it's just similar guns with different properties. There are types of weapons, which so far I've found pistols, SMGs, and shotguns. 1 million fatal guns is not that difficult if you're used to FPS games. And if it is a sequel, it is better than the original, but it literally is the exact same concept. On May 8th, 2021, Metamorphos was published. I got an achievement as soon as I spawned. I don't know whether to take this as a good or bad thing. This is a dungeon crawler game where instead of jumping, you have a sand dash. Who knew that Metamorphose would be my first Dark Souls game? Oh my gosh, it's literally the Dark Souls death screen. Now, what I'm going to say next is controversial, but I've never been a fan of Dark Souls or Souls-like games. To be fair, I've never played one. They just never seemed very appealing to me personally like the super hard rage games. In Metamorphose, I mean, technically, you don't have to fight anything for a while and just dodge past them. But then what is kind of the point of this fighting game? The destructible physics are nice, though. Next is Hide and Seek. So this game kept crashing. So uh, next one, I guess. Here's a trailer. Welcome to Hyde's magnificent manner of mystery and madness. <laughs> the hunt begins. Go, go and gather those gems. What a horrible night for a curse. First blood, double kill, monster kill! <laughs> Glorious! First blood! Let's see which guest survives tonight. <laughs> 
Merlot Above the Sun has a super simple control scheme, an intro cutscene that is somehow slow motion animation, and is a 3D platformer where the music is the loudest thing in the game. Now, I like 3D platformers, but this one feels bare bones with its simplistic controls. It just takes way too long to introduce anything new or interesting, and literally the first new move we get is a dodge in the second area. I'm trying so hard not to be harsh considering the context of these games, but I also have to play a hundred of these and some of them are just literally a fan-made version of another game instead of a original concept. So far with the 2021 games, I haven't been too impressed so far. Forgotten Journey has voice acting, where a woman falls through a portal and meets an alien, the jumping grunt sounds familiar although I can't place it, and there's a bunch of pressure plate puzzles. I think this is the first game on this list with actual climbing, which speaking of that, I have no clue how to jump off here. Oh, I have to hold it down first. Okay, that actually makes sense. The emotional end scene as the building is collapsing is unintentionally funny because it's trying to be sad and somber, but this alien is trying to have this long speech like, bro, just leave the building. Ransack raccoon. Cat? Cafe? A trash panda? Chill Jazz? Oh my gosh, this is game of the year. What incredible, unique, intuitive gameplay. Now this is what I'm talking about. Listen, just because I highly praise Sly Cooper, Indigo Park, and this game, even though both have raccoons, don't get all game theory on me and say I'm a furry. I just really like trash pandas, all right? Maybe I'm just accidentally gaslighting myself at this point, but as simple as this concept is, I actually think it's really fun. The art style is cartoonish and vibrant. The music is a vibe and it's a wholesome game. Sometimes simple is better. <laughs> the pause menu, oh my gosh, that's adorable. EFO is a 2D platformer where you you can use telekinesis to move blocks. Now, some might notice the immediate juxtaposition of the character in the world, and to that I say that he is an otherworldly creature with telekinesis. Name one human with telekinesis. I'll wait. I'm waiting. Now we have to rush to the extraction point before the battery runs out. Honestly, this character looks like a Blorgus. I would die for Blorgus. Cyberdad has drawn characters while dialogue is still happening. It is a low poly top-down shooter where robots are the enemies. You can find story snippets and guns, and the second floor has a new enemy type, an EMP landmine, and the floor is way more difficult. You also can't just ignore enemies, otherwise there will be an unignorable swarm. Taking them down one at a time is crucial. Floor 3 has literal tanks, floor 4 has a laser cannon and little rat droids, and Floor 5 is the boss. On October 14th, 2021, Codename Tiaris was published. This platformer has electronic music and two levels, Cyber City and Underground. When we play the game, we hear a robotic walking sound effect. You must collect these green cubes. And while the sound design is on point, the hitboxes are a bit inaccurate. I like the destructible physics though. The multi-layered background really makes the city feel alive, and then all of a sudden in level 2 it's a completely different environment. Something I noticed is that it's not often that we move left during a platformer. However, a subtle change that I didn't notice until the middle of the level is that the background color slowly shifts over time. Larika is a controller recommended game, and I chose Beginner because I don't know what to expect with this game to be honest. It's a third person open world game with a tutorial section. I immediately realized that jumping is very floaty. This is the world of opera, but oh no, people stopped caring about opera. This is why we have a flute that we can actually play. And not gonna lie, the gameplay mechanics are a bit confusing at first. Kinda wish it taught me how to play the flute for spells for I'm definitely bummed out at this point because this has been one of the more unique games I've seen so far, but actually it did tell us we just have to play scales. There's a bunch of mystical creatures walking around and you basically have to roam the land solving problems in the world of opera and this little guy tells you where to start. Hello and welcome to the first checkpoint. Out of the 50 games we've played so far, I'd confidently recommend 16 of them. Keep in mind, these are student games, and what I'm looking for are the most unique concepts, and generally the ones I found to be the most fun. In 2012, we have Perspective, 
in 2018, we have Phi and Halfway Home. In 2019, we have Aftermore, The Pilgrim, Adventure Slime, and Parasite. In 2020, we have Excalibots, Noir, Eos, Soulcaster, Isle of Limbo, and Goodnight Lily. And in 2021, we have Ransack Raccoon, EFO, and Larika. The last game of 2021 is Solaris Rift. This is a deck building roguelike, a genre that I am very familiar with and have a fondness for. In this game, it's humans versus robots, a tale as old as 1966. This game has two phases, action and combat. The action phase is where you spend mana on cards to use. Combat is where damage is taken. If there are no cards, your ship will take damage. Oh cool, two achievements at once. That's never happened to me before. Especially twice! The first game of 2022 is a top-down shooter where a sentient sprout shoots lab experiments, shooting, burrowing to dodge, and using the enemy shots against other enemies in this room-by-room -room roguelike is your strategy to survive. You have a charge shot, though that is pointless when it immobilizes your movement, and some rooms give you special abilities. Tag, the power of pain. Now this is a game I am very familiar with. What I'm not familiar with is that OBS is still giving the game a goofy crop for some reason. Don't toggle full screen however otherwise the game freezes. While I do like this game I will admit it can be finicky at times when you tab out of the game and try to tab it in because it typically crashes. So while we aren't off to a great start the actual gameplay is pretty enjoyable. Something that is standing out to me already is the interactive start screen where a paint can that's constantly changing colors influences the color of the button. A perfect representation of the game's core mechanic. Why vandalize when you can just play this game instead? Green paint is bouncy, floating paint are portals. This gun shoots all colors of paint to solve physics based platforming puzzles. Actually, never mind, it crashed the game again. Man, I don't remember the game being this unstable. You can either shoot or erase the paint you shot. This little canister down here tells you which ability you have equipped, and I know what you're gonna say, but the gun is the same color, so it's pointless. Actually, no, because think of the colorblind people. I know it's just a little detail, but when it comes to accessibility, I'm all for it. Using the paint, we can accomplish many feats like wall jumping, use ramps to scale buildings, and avoid obstacles. The last two things I will mention is that you can have multiple canisters in one gun. Blue is sticky, which I believe is the last color because you only have three slots on your gun, meaning you can have multiple canisters in one gun. On April 29th, 2022, Ceramic Soul was published. Probably the most stylized controller screen I've seen so far. This is the first horror game on this list. We can take off our hand to get into other places of the map. While stumbling around, we can find items, open doors, and our mission is to unlock these change. We can hide from what I believe to be the owners of the mansion, and man, those footsteps are eerie. This game is actually quite tense, because if you get caught, you die instantly. So I was missing a doll to get the key, when all of a sudden she just spawns in front of me, which actually kind of spooked me. In this game, you must solve the puzzles to get each key. So I go to the flower room, and there is just nothing here. And now the ghost has a bad habit of just camping a specific spot. In fact, the exact spot we are supposed to go. This is where I got stuck. I got two horses, I can't use this vent, and the entire time the game says go to the piano, I'm here and I can't interact with it. Shadowbringer is a first person alien escape room. We can crouch, lean, shadow box, teleport, and do a visual scan. The alien is allergic to light, meaning we are basically a gremlin. Wait, so what is shadow holding? I hear you asking. Well, it's like a force choke, except they go to the bad place. So I'm supposed to obtain a key card, but I already have one from earlier, and we can't just check the body, cause, you know. From here, climbing is now accessible, and sure enough, we find the key card. If you get caught, you die, meaning this is a full-on stealth game. I wish I could toggle crouch so that way I don't have to hold it down with my pinky every time, but that's a choice. Now this next game features a racist. No, not like that. In Shadow Racer, the scenery is beautiful, though I've never seen a grassy hill in a desert before and a waterfall. We can talk to fellow cars, which is how we start our mission. Finding Knit is our current objective, and after spotting Knit, we must chase him down. Overall, it's actually pretty relaxing to roam around the desert. Also, this game has portals and a device that launches cars away from you, leading to chaotic explosions. This flash also has multiple purposes, as it can charge batteries. The game then turns into Trials Evolution out of nowhere for a little bit, and then a turbo function is now unlocked after we fell into a trap, and that turbo is the only way to leave the 
the trap. I will say, for a game about sentient cars, the lore goes crazy. In this specific area, there's a giant basketball and hoop that are used to open a gate, which are also explosives. Radios are scattered about for more lore drops. I saw a floating tire, so I restarted the chapter until I got it. Not sure exactly what it does, I think it increases battery. In order to become the next Shadow Racer, we must complete these challenges in an initiation. Once we finally beat a race, we get another upgrade that destroys objects in our way. All of a sudden, there's alien spaceships? Wow, I guess the previous game is connected, huh? Arc Light Beat is a rhythm-based puzzle game. Here, you have a four-count beat, and you can input different sounds to impact how the level is influenced. Each level has a different song and block setup. There are specific spaces where you can edit the timeline of the sounds. We can wall jump and there's only three chapters. Syra's Ascent has an intro cutscene where I don't know what's going on here. This is a third person spellcasting action adventure game where we fight monsters as we ascend the mountain. The monsters are pretty interesting, the boss was super easy, and then the game makes you do that same boss fight like four more times. It's just not very satisfying of a fight, moreover annoying than anything. The journey is fine, but then the boss battles are just not that interesting because all you have to do is spam your frost attack. RUO is another game that isn't in English. This is a first person game. I think this is a horror game, though I honestly can't tell. So I was right. And we must purge the demons from the paintings. And if you misclick, then you die. But once I died, I spawned here. I'm stuck. Not really a spooky game to be honest, but a bunch of weird stuff happens. Fly By Night has a completely opposite vibe from the last game. In this 2D platformer, we are a bird who collects cherries and crystals, and there are 80 cherries in total. We also have a sword, I think, to kill slimes, and once we collect all the crystals, we can leave through this castle. The Rabbit's Scroll is another 2D platformer where we have to collect fruit. This game is very artistic, and I love the little wall trail the bunny leaves. In this game, it is possible to bamboo climb, and Dash, which also helps us. All of a sudden, the darkness attempts to consume us. Kogarashi is a third-person samurai game that spawns frozen monsters. These monsters sometimes have swords and guns, and I appreciate that when you get hit, the screen gets more frozen. It's just those little details that I really like. When you see these flying monsters, parrying is an option, so that is something that you can also use during combat in general. Executions are available, and the lava skin texture looks so cool. Just a Humble Swordsmith is an 8-bit idle sword making game. We must pick one of three adventurers, which refreshes every time. Going into the cave, we unlock a chest that gives us new materials and styles. Once you reach a checkpoint, you don't have to start from the beginning. Each character uses specific perks while fighting, and out of all of them, first aid seems to be the best so far, as well as optimism and crescent guard. This game was a lot of fun. There's actually progress that you can make that just feels satisfying. I beat the game in like 13 minutes, and I wish there was more. However, at the end credits, it gave us a code to unlock everything when we reset the run. So I did that and beat it again. Ah, uh, a game of chess. FPS chess, that is. Instead of just taking your piece, you face in a 1v1 match to the death. Since there is no one online, I had to resort to local play, which yes, there is split screen. Each chess piece has a different weapon. Pawns have rifles and can dash. Horses shoot L arrows and can move other pawns. Bishops use bombs and can fly. Rooks can build up walls and can become Spider-Man. The queen shoots pawns and can float. The king can bring enemies closer as well as friendlies when he lands. Oh, and actually each one of these chess pieces have different abilities if they are in the shiny version. If you knock pieces over, it does not carry over to the actual chess match. And I could see myself having a lot of fun with this game if I found someone else to play it with me. Blast off far away is a space shooter. We must protect the planets from space squids. But running out of oxygen is a huge hazard, so we must jump from planet to planet to defeat these waves of squids. Veggie Menace has an intro freeze frame cinematic in this 2D wizard platformer where we shoot evil vegetables. Looks like VeggieTales didn't age quite so well. This game can be multiplayer, and occasionally a guy with a bag will appear to give you a special ability, and each level has a boss fight at the end, and the stakes aren't too high because you have infinite lives. Froggy's Farm and Friends. This is a 2D, 3D, top-down farming game where the characters are 2D cardboard in a 3D space with a top-down camera angle. The objective is in the top left corner corner, like collecting flowers, watering plants, etc. The music is very calming. We can collect essence to further upgrade our farm. There's different seeds that give different rewards, 
very cute game. Aurelia is a top-down RPG where you throw blue flames to attack. You kind of just walk around and kill monsters. We must save five little creatures, and it definitely gets harder as it goes due to enemies' health bars increasing with every new friend found. Cooper's Cleanup. I love this interactive main menu. We are a Roomba that learns the area as it goes around the house. I like to go around the corners so that way I can see the layout of the map better. In this game, you have to find the sparkly dots to open the next door and continue on. Beach Island Deluxe. For once, there is an artist statement. This one is from Kevin. Beach Island Deluxe is an improved version of a solo senior project that I created in four months during my last semester while attending DigiPen Institute of Technology. This game is a culmination of nearly every skill I've developed over my career and is the single greatest achievement I have currently reached from just my efforts alone. Nine-year-old me would have been blown away at what he'd be able to create on his own 20 years later. I'm incredibly thankful that I've stayed dedicated to this path my whole life and that I had the opportunity to create something like this to give to the world. The whole point of Beach Island is to give you a bite-sized world to explore entirely at your own pace. I wanted to make something that any player of any skill or familiarity with games would be able to quickly pick up and play and be able to engage with the challenges they found the most fun and still be able to finish the game. There is no right or wrong way to play Beach Island. The challenges of the island will always be there when you feel ready to tackle them. If you ever feel like tackling them, this game means a lot to me personally and not just in terms of my own personal growth and self-actualization of my dreams. While I was developing Beach Island, I was not in a safe and stable situation while also having to pass my other classes. This project wasn't just a passion project for me, it was my anchor to who I was as a person, a reminder of who I wanted to be while fighting to not lose myself. I'm glad I stuck to the game. I survived without regrets because of it. Never give up who you are for someone else. Stay kind to yourself and others. Don't let yourself down. From the depths of my soul, thank you for playing Beach Island Deluxe. Kevin. That that was actually beautiful. I, I, I just got done reading that for the first time, and wow, that was that was incredible. There is a standard mode and speedrun mode. This is a 3D platformer where you must collect all the stars. We can find 7 stars, but there's actually 15. There are normal stars and timed stars. At certain checkpoints, you'll unlock a moving platform so it's easy to get back to the same spot. Once we gain 7 stars, the portal spawns, which is how you end the game. In speedrun, it's basically the exact same concept, but you have a stopwatch. Return to the Skyway is a 2D platformer where you can pick up and throw animals. Not gonna lie, this one made me feel a little weird to play, especially because they die after you throw them. This is one of those experiences where I wish there was an author's note for this one, because how can a person come up with this concept, and, and why would they do that? Why, why, why? <laughs> synth Alexi is a top-down puzzle game with synth music in the background. One mechanic to these puzzles is using other blocks to your advantage to solve. By the second level, I was already having a tough time, and in the second area, I get a gun, which also comes with a shield. Dimensional Gears. In Dimensional Gears, the how to play screen is like 11 pages long for some reason. We are Mike in this 2D space as a 3D character. In this game, you must collect popcorn because we are a microwave. Oh, I get it now. Scattered across the area are keys that you need to collect to unlock doors. And actually, this is not a 2D space. It's a 3D space that looks like a 2D space. In order to carry objects, you put them in the microwave. I love this attention to detail. It's so good. And since we got another gear, now we can shift an additional time. Hanyo was created with code and not a pre-made engine, has six different languages, different warriors or different difficulties. There's voice acting in the cutscene, and this is a dark 2D platformer. When an enemy appears, you automatically go into a fighting stance, and these enemies will kill you in one shot, even on easy mode. Once we die, a cutscene plays, and we get sent into training. Depending on the direction you're holding, you will either attack or block in that direction. The loading screen is a black and white drawing of war. If you get hit once you are dead, depending on the enemy type, you have to either block or dodge. And the art style is simply beautiful. Cyber Slayer is a top-down wave shoot, dash, and shoot to survive. It's pretty simple. This is a sort of bottomless clip situation, so no reloading is necessary. Now what are we fighting exactly? Well, it kind of just looks like 
shapes and colors, but if I had to guess, I'd say robots, since the game is called Cyber Slayer. After the first round is over, it counts the glory as the audience throws down specific upgrades, even to the gun. However, once the robot dies, that upgrade is taken off the gun, so it's very limited. New guns can also be thrown to us between waves. I didn't feel the difficulty increase until round three, but man, you can instantly feel the shift in how tough this challenge gets out of nowhere. Sorcerer Standoff requires two controllers to play. This is a bit of an issue since I only have one one working controller as far as I know, and even if I did, I am not two people. So I tried the tutorial, and what's interesting about this game is that I have never seen a multiplayer split screen tutorial before, but it makes sense here. We have different spells per button on the controller, and we can cast it in different directions, as well as use enchantments. Basically, this is wizard pong, because the camera is fixed, and you have to defeat the other wizard by casting spells and moving back and forth. Not a good single player experience, but I'm sure multiplayer is fun. Utoma recommends you use a controller to play and has a very creepy aesthetic already. This is a fast platformer where you can grapple onto things. I absolutely love this dark, gritty art style. Out of all these platformers I've played so far by this publisher, this one stands out to me the most and feels the most polished and stylized. We can also throw attacks to oncoming enemies, and the boss fight is actually really challenging. That specific character moves in very strange, out of this world ways, and is the most unique boss fight I've stumbled across so far. This next game is one of those games I kept recognizing on the Steam page, and that is Breadsticks. This this is a 2D platformer where you can throw bread that sticks. Oh, I get it now. On top of the fox's head is the little cup of tea, coffee, ticino. Not sure. This platformer has your hands on both the keyboard and mouse since the keyboard is to move and the mouse is to place the bread. Now wall jumping is available here, however, you have to time it perfectly otherwise you will die. So there is a bit of a learning curve here. Candles are checkpoints, you can use the bread to give you a jump boost, if you time it right you can get some huge air time, and each level resets your bread count to zero so you have to collect them each time. Witch Punk is the game that started all of my research with Digipen. The intro has a skateboarding cutscene, and once the game starts, this is a vibrant skate and break game. You can grind, shoot magic, bash enemies in this very small area. One ability fills your combo meter, which increases your damage to enemies. In the corner, the story and lore takes place, which is also how you get objectives, I guess, and the objective is to just keep smashing robots. I wish there was a visual meter to help signify how many more robots I had to kill, because they just keep spawning. Vani is a top-down action-adventure game. Where where we collect berries, watch cutscenes, break rocks with our magical floating sword, make potions, shoot with your sword, and collect tags as well as shells. The first game of 2023 is called Shiner. The menu is just someone punching someone else. This is gonna be a weird game, isn't it? This is a 1v1 fighting game with voice acting, and you can learn new abilities when you win matches. There are four monsters in this room we can fight. I won against Scrimpo, then Sharpnut, then Gorbis. Since we have learned more than four fighting moves, there's a customizable inventory that is now unlocked since we can only have four slots. I finally beat the gatekeeper, and in this next area, I realized that sometimes you have to defeat certain enemies before others, and now we have to beat up Red. Sorry, Red. In this second area, it is way more difficult than the first one, but it's actually really satisfying to figure out which combo moves are necessary to win a fight. Green Reaper is the next one. There is an intro cinematic of a garden, and after we play as a flower warrior, where we attack monsters, use special moves on a cooldown which can be filled by defeating mushrooms, sprint, dodge, and I also just got the name. Instead of Grim Reaper, it's Green Reaper. Man, some of these games have really clever names. I like that the health bars are above the enemy, except when the enemy is taller than me, then it becomes an inconvenience. Poggle Wash has an intro cinematic of beautiful landscapes. We play as a robot who is tasked to clean up an island. Immediately, I ran into frame rate issues, so I changed it to 60 FPS. And then after that, it worked completely fine. This is a 3D platformer where we clean off slime. In this specific island, there are 10 stars that are collectible. Each level is an island with its own stars. I love the visual meter that is tucked away in the corner that signifies how clean the island is. I honestly don't want to stop playing this game. Familiar is a battle simulator where monsters fight to the death. 
different monsters have different abilities in this actually really difficult game, and you have to strategize who goes best with which enemy type. Mirage is a stylized 2D platformer using both 2D and 3D elements, and one hit kills you. Cataclysm has an intro cinematic and is a top-down fighter where we can melee and shoot the robots into junk. We can dash and collect cassettes, zip through telephone wires, use jukeboxes as checkpoints, throw hooks to travel across gaps as well as disable enemy shields, and throw frisbees. On June 16th, 2023, Anu was published. We are on top of a snowy mountain where there's dialogue but not voice acting. Using a grappling hook, we can grab our bag which immediately slows you down, however it is necessary to climb down. This bag is able to be unequipped when needed, but you gotta remember to grab it otherwise invisible walls will trap you. In this game you use a rope to climb and you will always find a fireplace at the end of a level. Our notebook has drawings and some lore and we can ski down hills. Graplania is an 8-bit 2D platformer where we can jump and chain whip, as well as gain green gems. Our weapon in this game is a chain which can break barriers and has multiple uses like as a rope to swing on. Later there are moving platforms which makes platforming a little bit more difficult and when when the platforming seems to get hard out of nowhere, I recommend using a D-pad, which is perfect for grabbing targets while in the air. Galactic Grinder is a skateboarding game with five areas to skate on. Moon, Earth, Helos, Bacchus, and Black Hole. In this game, skating has been banned, and we skate in this 2D plane, and the first level is a tutorial. Jumping with the directional pad makes you do tricks, you can grind and grab, checkpoints are available so you don't have to restart the level, you can do super tricks, as well as double jumps, which is losing your board, but you can call it back. Astrality is a 2D shooter that looks 3D and has 3D elements. Some characters will talk on screen as pop-ups, as you shoot targets with blasters, teleport dash, and destroy UFOs. And if you destroy these UFOs without getting hit, you will have a fast shoot rate as you dodge obstacles in the process. In Shroom and Doom, our objective is to defeat 15 waves of enemies. Well, that's probably not going to happen. We are a PNG that looks like a tank as we shoot other PNGs. Okay, considering how slow the game is, 15 waves might actually be easy. When we destroy these PNGs, these monsters drop leaves. At wave 4, there are giant beetles that spawn, and I got to round 8. And then I realized I wasn't recording. But then I realized that I could do special moves, meaning the leaves actually do something. And these three abilities are Snow Shroom, Fungal Flinger, and Cap Crusher. All right, so at this point, we're going to do a speed round as we summarize these last few games. Midnight Witch Starlight, a wizard beat-em-up with four spells to use. The Princess's Dragon, an 8-bit story that's an adventure game where you are a princess with a sword who fights monsters. Finally, The Legend of Link Drop. Delta Blade 2700 Recreate, a remake of a previous game with literally more customization modes and a level editor. Minute is a third-person action adventure game where you are a toy robot and you can use your key in a bunch of different ways to solve puzzles. English is Hard, a cannon shooter game where you turn aliens into cannon fodder that's also a typing game. Energy Tanks, a two-player shooter where you literally can't start it without a second working controller. Project Nasu, a 2D platformer where you are an alien who shoots to do literally everything. Tugboat Terror, a story-based game where you play a fishman hybrid who loves to sail. And lastly, Divergence, a third-person shooter with explosions, time travel, voice acting, and an epic intro cinematic. That was the last game in the catalog and the last game of 2023. If it was still October of 2023, but currently it's July 1st of 2024, meaning... Wait a minute, we... We still aren't done with 2023? It just... It keeps going. It... It doesn't stop. It, it will never stop. No matter how far I go, it will never be enough. I will never be successful because I'm chasing something that is unattainable. The last game of 2023 is Dim Light Dungeon. This is a 2D fighting game with three different buttons for dealing damage. Although it's not really fair because all I got is fists and these enemies have swords. Level by level, we fight the same soldier over and over again until we die. It is now 2024 and there haven't been a whole lot of games released this year. So because of that, we are going to summarize the ones that have already been released because a lot of them didn't really stand out to me in terms of the entire catalog, but there are a few that I will spend a little bit more time 
time on because I actually think that they are really good. The first game of 2024 is called Scrap and Battery, a seven level robot fighter where battery management is a big focus. Instructions, a game, quote unquote, where you click a button over and over again while a narrator makes fun of you. Paper Planes, a multiplayer game where you destroy all planes. In Line, Out of Time, a 2D platformer where you are a rollerblading delivery boy. Combat Cat, a 2D platformer where you are a rocket boot cat that shoots slimes. Killanova has an intro cinematic, and I gotta say, this main menu screen is beautiful, with the Nova being part of the O as the music occasionally swells in a peaceful manner. There's voice acting, but it's in a different language, and this is a fighter with a focus on combos. Puzzle Garden, eight levels of growing plants for profit in this gardening simulator. One in a Krillion, you play as one Krill fighting fish until you summon a swarm and cause chaos. Mouse Ventures, a mouse goes on an adventure in a storybook that's actually just a push the block puzzle game. Abyssal, which is the first turn-based top-down RPG on this list. You move in a grid-based fashion with four options. Movement, Shooting Magic, Storm Pulse, and Fell Flare. You can also use allies as weapons. Chrono Club Race Against Time, a time-bending racing game with items galore. The last game of 2024 that is currently released is called Slap That, and this is the best game that has released in 2024 so far. Slap That released on July 29th of 2024. So literally, not even joking, two to three days ago this is a first person slap simulator no literally you can just destroy everything if you slap a person enough times they get mad at you slapping the dj table launches you slapping the lever gets you to the next level you can also grab stuff and slap enemies what i love about this game is that each level introduces a new element so that way you don't get bored man what a fun one to end on thank you for watching this documentary that took me way too long to make i don't have a written conclusion i wanted to do like a heartfelt thing i still need to edit the video but currently this is all i have left to record and then we can finally fully edit the video i just want to say thank you everybody for supporting me these past few years I made the channel in like 2011 and I started posting in 2016 and it's almost been a whole decade since I've been doing this and it's been really cool to see all these students making these games because it's been really interesting to see like other people's creativity especially in like the gaming space especially in the indie gaming space obviously so I really wanted to challenge myself to play all of these games so currently I don't have a list made up but here are all of the games that I would recommend out of this list of like 113 games definitely check these out or go through the entire catalog yourself if you really want to all of them are free there's no microtransactions some games to play you know and well yes i'm not a game developer myself i have played games for years and it's been really interesting to see how these people at this university came together and made these projects and i think that's really impressive from a technical standpoint. So while I am very much a art appreciator, a indie connoisseur, for the past few years, I have been dabbling in being an artist, not on YouTube, but as a musician.